they want to share with everybody or did it resonate so much that you've just got to share it or would you just like to keep it to yourself? You didn't get one because you just came in, but this is one of my favourites. <laughs> Hunger is a good cook. <laughs> Who agrees with that? Who finds like, yeah, I, I know I, when I want to cook, my healthy, large appetite really helps me get inspired to be in the kitchen. So, uh, yeah, I think that's a good one. All right, so it's, uh, we're going to go away to Italy, southern Italy tonight, and um, I hope you enjoy a little bit of escapism, um, particularly with um, the world the way it is at the moment. It's nice to just um, focus on some things that are a bit lighter as well. So, um, yeah, I hope you enjoy tonight. Um, so, we're going to get started on how this book, A Vegan Summer in Southern Italy, came into existence and the journey to uh, creating it by traveling to southern Italy, my heritage and just my love of uh, vegan Italian food. And also at the end, if you like, I'm just going to share a little bit of the self-publishing journey if anybody is uh, curious about that as well, how to self-publish as opposed to traditional publishing. But first of all, just to get to know you a little bit, hands up who's been to Italy before? Wow, okay. Hands up who's been to southern Italy. So let's talk below Rome, below, yeah, okay. Who's uh, got Italian heritage? <laughs> Is anybody from the south? <laughs> Can you tell me where? Basilicata. Ah, Basilicata, beautiful, beautiful. Yes, I do mention Basilicata tonight and in the cookbook. Um, so, what's another one? Who loves uh, cooking Italian food? Who likes eating vegan food, plant-based? Who happens to be plant-based or vegan? Okay, cool. And who loves to eat? <laughs> We're going to get on fine. Good. We're the right audience. Excellent. Okay, let's get started. So... Um, so most of the photos that I'm going to show you tonight um, aren't actually in the cookbook. There's a couple at the beginning, but most of them are behind the scenes, so you get a little bit of an insight into uh, the travels as well that didn't make it, make it to the cookbook. So tonight uh, I want to show, share with you um, the South and the trip to the South and also my heritage. So, my father is from southern Italy in the region of Campania. He came over when he was nine years old. And my mum's Aussie, so I have a bit of a mix. That's why my pronunciation is pretty terrible. So please forgive me. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so part of me already loved Italian food. And when I went vegan, then I really wanted to recreate um, a lot of those dishes that I grew up with, but also really highlight the ones that were already plant-based. There's a lot of accidentally vegan dishes in the south of Italy and that's why I wanted to especially write this cookbook to really share how wonderful the food is and how much you can feast as a, as a vegan or plant-based um, in Italy. So yeah, all these photos are going to be of the south. All right, it all began in 2016. I have, of course, been dreaming of going to Italy for a long time but it didn't take, it, but it took until 2016 to get there. I think because I had travelled around Australia a lot, I was the the eternal student. I didn't have a lot of money, so I finally got there in 2016. And I don't know, if, so uh, quite a few of you have been to Italy, haven't you? Yeah. So I don't know, have you ever felt when you get to Italy, something in you just sort of, I don't know, it opens up something. It just, suddenly you become a bit obsessed with Italy. It's just that really special place. So after I went there, it was just like this, I don't know, it opened something up. So I just really, uh, really got into the Italian cooking even more than I already loved it. And when I went to the South, I discovered um, some really beautiful cuisine and places and regions. So up here, over here, this stone house, this is where my father actually and his mother grew up. So this is in the town, just outside the town of Molinara in the Camp Campania region, in the province of Benevento. And it's an old stone house and the fa extended family lived there, even the animals lived downstairs in like, you know, one of the little, um, yeah, the bottom area, which we actually went inside and it kind of was a bit grotty as you can imagine. So the farm animals lived in there. And so, yeah, it was quite, my cousin actually took that photo. It was, I can't claim it, it's so beautiful. So I had to put it in the cookbook. Um, and over here, this is 
Where's our Basilicata? Yeah. Where is this one? A bit hard to see, isn't it? Um, it was featured in the latest James Bond movie. Matera. Ah, brava. Matera. So this is a, a city within um, Basilicata and it's um, famed um, it's in this beautiful historical city and also Passion of the Christ was filmed there as well. It's just, it doubles as this, you know, older sort of world, um, like uh, yeah, places like Jerusalem or, or you know other sorts of older sort of places, and it's really beautiful. Um, and also here, I was on in a town called Nocelli on the top above Positano on the Amalfi Coast, and we just um, we just come home. We just actually got off the bus, a really long bus ride, and the um, the Airbnb person uh, looked after us with this beautiful um, veg vegetables and all these sorts of dishes. So. Part of this cookbook is the 2016 journey. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit more and go to 2019. So I went there 2016, 2017, but then I went north. And then 2019, I went back deliberately thinking, I want to write a cookbook. I'm just not sure when. And so um, then I, I, I thought, I'm just going to taste my way through the south. And uh, we were in Italy for three months, but about two of those were, in, were down in the south. So I very deliberately tried to eat as much as I possibly could. I mean, it's terrible, I know. Um, <laughs> what a horrible thing to do. But I thought, well, it's for the greater good. So the cookbook um, is actually the journey that you see with those red dots there. Um, that's, that is um, a combination of 2016 and 2019 sort of rolled into one. And this map is in the cookbook. Um, so uh, how, oh, who can guess which region is missing from this map? It's kind of a little obscure. It's an island. Ah, yes, <laughs> well done. Sardinia. So then, yeah, so it's, it's a little bit more up the top here. So I didn't get there, so it doesn't include in the map. And unfortunately, we only went through Calabria. We didn't taste our way through it. So next trip for sure. Um, so that was our, our trip, um, all those little dots. It wasn't a typical journey. It was here, there, and everywhere. But um, I think that's what made it um, unique, and hopefully the cookbook is too. All right, let's dive in. Okay, the, the cuisine of the South, it's so vegan friendly. Okay, there's meat and dairy there. There is a lot of that, but there's so many beautiful dishes uh, that are traditional. Uh, there's, a, there's a sort of type of cuisine that they call cucina povera, which is a sort of peasant's way of cooking. Uh, in the South, it's traditionally known as a little bit oh, poorer than the North. So, of course, cooking with meat and dairy and animal products was a luxury. So they didn't deliberately want to be vegan. They just couldn't afford to have, say, meat, cheese, meat at every meal. And um, when I talked to my uncle a few months ago, he said, actually, we were raised mostly vegetarian because, you know, the family just couldn't afford it. So, of course, back here, they're like, you know, all the meat and stuff we can handle. But back then, it was, um, it was quite different. And what's so nice about that is that there are, there's like all these great recipes that are tr still traditionally made today. They're just without eggs or they're without dairy or using breadcrumbs instead of parmesan and you know, all those sorts of fun things. So yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's dive into each uh, region. All right, so let's start with Campania on the Amalfi Coast. The lemons are bigger and sweeter and beautiful in, in, in uh, Lemoncello and Granita. And you can find it in, you know, even a lemon spaghetti sort of pasta. Uh, your tomatoes and fruits and vegetables, they just sing because of the ocean air and the, you know, volcano uh, Mount Vesuvius isn't too far away as well. So um, up here we've got, uh, that was from the Airbnb we we're staying in. Tomatoes, there's plenty of tomatoes, like really simple dishes you can still enjoy, like um, spaghetti pomodoro and pizza marinara, just, you know, it just sings and with that liquid oil on top, I mean, you know, it's good. Uh, this one's a funny little story here. Um, so we've just got off the bus. We've come from we come from Rome actually to the Amalfi Coast, and we had to take several buses. And my husband and I had a little little tiff because you know you know when you travel you get a little bit antsy with each other. So you can. It's very stressful sometimes. And so we'd had this bit of an argument. We returned up and. The lady who owned this place wasn't picking up her phone and we were like, we're lugging these, this luggage behind us and anyway, and very hot, very hot. And so once we turned up, it was just like, oh, 
She cooked us this al dente spaghetti. She had zucchini from her garden, which was like scaling the cliffs. Um, so she, she was almost like, um, like terraces along the cliffs that were, um, the garden was growing up. All organic, all heirloom, she said. And we joked about how I put a little seed in my luggage or something like that, take it back. Of course I didn't. Um, the basil was just from around the corner there behind me. And this is quite a traditional Amalfi Coast uh, uh, just a zucchini simple pasta with basil and um, sometimes they put a bit of parmesan in it use the cooking pasta cooking water to make it all creamy but it's easy to leave out the parmesan no problem so that's what we had that day all right let's go to naples who's been to naples who's had pizza in naples who knows about the pizza in naples all right well it's this famed uh, it's the place to go for great wood-fired pizza. They even have their own association to make sure the pizza's made just right and you don't make it a different way. Um, and so, yeah, we've got the special uh, San Manzano, Manzano tomatoes. So they're like, um, like this, this sort of tomato, teardrop shape, and uh, grown near Mount Vesuvius. Um, Naples is great, of course, for pizza and cake. There's a lot of pastries. They're not necessarily vegan, but you can certainly find things. So, what do you think these people on, on the left here are lining up for? Come on. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would probably be the other thing people would line up for. Good guess. Anyone else? We're in Naples. Pizza. Got to be pizza. So, actually, it went, the line went further up. This was right in the city centre. And we walked past, husband and I, and we went, do we want to line up? Uh, it's supposed to be the best place in Naples. Nah, let's go to this other place, this little hole in the wall kind of place. And I tell you what, it, I don't think it matters too much where you go. If you're a sort of at a decent sort of little pizzeria and you watch them make it in front of you, like, it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And it was, you can see from my happy face, it was really, really good. Um, and the curious thing about this night, we only spent one night in Naples, um, and this dish here is actually strips of fried pizza dough. Oh. Yeah, and it was like an entree, and so we had it with the rocket and the basil and the, and the tomatoes. And it was so we ordered that. I thought that looked really cool to have as a starter. So we had that, and then we went on to have more pizza dough for me. So we really stuck by the end. No regrets. Um, but this one is really interesting. Like the stories behind each dish. You know how sometimes pasta has these really interesting names, like in Italian, and it translates to something really interesting, um, like you know, farfalle or butterflies and orecchiettes. Do you know who it is? And um, and that's just like the start. There's so many, and um, this one is called uh, Stracetti, but it has a special name in this area um, called Scucchnesi. And Scucchnesi is actually the name for the street kids of Naples. Uh, years and years ago, talking about like maybe eight, mid 1800s, 1900s, there was a lot of really poor street kids, really sad. Um, but they were called Scucchnesi, like scrappy little kids, and so now they're called the dish scrappy little kids. So there's a story behind so many things. That's the fun of food. All right, Benevento. Uh, now we're getting into the province where my family's from. Apples, a special variety of apples. They're famed for the Anurka apple. Um, that you'll find that in liqueur, even savory dishes. They love the apples. It's very peasant kind of simple food. Um, lots of um, rustic pastas and, and chickpeas and things like that. And so this one here, so we're in this, the village of Sant'Agata Aga, San di Gotti, and it's like got this gorgeous cliff face. And uh, I think, let me show you quickly where. I think I have it on this one. Yeah, see this one here on the right? Yeah. That's the place where we went in one afternoon for this, this um, meal that I'm about to show you. It's a beautiful place. So quiet. It's really off the tourist um, journey, you know, off the tourist trail. Not a lot are going there, so it's a good little place to to get a real authentic experience. And so this is pettole pasta made with chickpea, like a chickpea cream and truffles from the mountains nearby. Um, this one is a karali, a special type of karali, different to the ones I'm giving you tonight. Um, but these ones are, I kind of joke that it looks a little bit like the Aryan of the never ending story, like it had that, you know, the never ending story movie, it had that funny little ring. I always sort of reminded me of that. And so you dip it in a wine and they had this beautiful vegan meal, um, just accidentally vegan for us. They just, they might have changed a few things around, but it was already on the menu. 
and this is just you know a simple bean dish um, when we went to a special farm stay. So there's just like lots of things to enjoy. Now we're in the town of my father. This is where we did a, we did a lot of eating. <laughs> so, um, so here's some wonderful feasts that we had at my dad's family's family. Um, it's his cousin, so my second cousin. And first we went there in 2016 and she had no idea what vegan was. I, I totally get that because they're in a little village. And um, so when we turned up in 2016 for lunch, we'd already eaten, but she had made this meat lasagna, which uh, I'm sure it tasted delicious, but of course we wouldn't eat it. And so we had these other things that she made on the side, which were really lovely. So fast forward to 2019, she must have followed me on Facebook. She understood a little bit more. And when we got there, she was like all over it. She, um, she was amazing, like the food that she cooked really reminded me of my nonna's cooking. So we had fried eggplants just battered with a flour and water. We had the potato and capsicum, more roasted capsicum, stuffed um, homegrown capsicums and eggplants off the top. Just real simple plant-based food. They grow their own white beans there. Um, the chima de rapa or the turnip tops with arakiek there. I'm very happy to be helping making a lettuce salad um, in their home. So it was really quite lovely to see the change, the shift from 2016 to a few years later when it's like suddenly veganism here is a bit of a buzzword, but in Italy it's, you know, certain places you understand it's, there's a lot of tradition. So to actually get her to, what she sort of learned along the way was really great. Um, a funny little story was in 20, 2016, her husband um, offered us a salami that he made himself. Has his own pigs and things like that. So that was just a little bit, you know, hard to say no, no thanks. But he gave us, he gave, like, he goes, have this, have this. And, and, and I'm like, no, 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 we don't, we don't eat meat. And he's like, it's not meat. <laughs> <laughs> Salami's not meat. Just remember that if you're in a little village. <laughs> Doesn't look like meat. Let's go to Puglia. Um, I would say this region is the most vegan friendly region in um, Italy in the south, not because it's known, but just because it's accidentally so uh, vegan and so full of plant-based cuisine. Uh, so the tarali there, um, or you know, mostly, unless it's the sweet stuff, all without eggs and a variety of flavors. That one's sultana and onion. Um, and of course, we're in Lecce there, so our Airbnb had a, ter or, uh, a terrace up the top, so each night, of course, wine and tarali. Um, I was taking a pasta class. I really wanted to learn from the locals and so I managed to find a pasta class where they taught us uh, three different types of local pasta. And this one um, over here on the right is called sanya torte, which is um, you roll it, like you sort of roll it with one hand and so it sort of turns into a, a little curly kind of piece of pasta. And yeah, it was really, really lovely. And always made without eggs, this pasta. So it's, it was pretty exciting for me to go, oh, more food I can eat. This one is um, latte di mandola, which is uh, almond, almond milk, but their almond milk is more like a syrup. Um, of course, they have a sort of bit more regular almond milk, but this one is something that you drink um, with ice and coffee, like an espresso and a bit of syrup in it. Uh, really beautiful. It's called cafe leche, and, and it's a delicious drink. Um, the markets in leche, and uh, this alcamora bread is known all over Italy, but also particularly there. It's supposed to be easy to digest, um, made with beautiful flour. Was it like after? Oh, the chilies, the chili peppers. So. Um, this is there's a sun dried and then often fried, and you can sprinkle it on top of pastas or stews or even into pasta. Right? Feel free to add something if you like. <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd be like, yeah, I'm sure I would love. I'd love to sit down and talk to you about. Should have consulted with you before I did. This. <laughs> but it's beautiful, really rustic, um, also really simple food. I think there was a lot of you know uh, it was. A lot of you know hard times in Basilicata as well. So you know keeping a lot of things like you know legumes and pastas and pasta without eggs. Um, but the pane de, de matera, the, the bread of matera, is also this beautiful kind of bread. It's just wood fired, really interesting shape, um, really easy to, to digest, beautiful bread. And this one here is a pasta using that crushed chili. 
So inside that, so it's the uh, uh, pasta, pepperoni, crush, is it crushy? Crushy, crushy. And uh, yeah, so that was gorgeous. And black chickpeas as well, I thought was really cool. They tasted quite similar to the white ones, but um, yeah, it was, it was a real, it was a real hoot having black chickpeas. It was great. So yeah, beautiful. Okay, and finally, finally, Sicilia, Sicily, uh, the land of pistachios and almonds and granita and couscous to just mix it up a little bit and spices and, um, and, and pine nuts and capers and uh, plant-based cuisine that's been um, injected by also the volcano as well. So it's just beautiful, fertile soil. Um, and one of my favorite street foods here is pane e panela. Uh, and so it's like a dry, it's a fried chickpea fritter and you eat it in bread and this one had um, some potato um, fried as well on top. But that is, um, oh, that's a gorgeous street food, a little bit like, you know, chip, hot chip sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> but a little cooler maybe. Um, so this one's a granita, so it's like a, just fruit and ice and it's glorious. Um, oh, fruit, ice and sugar, don't forget sugar. And so we've got almonds and I think peach, and this is just a cute little market here in Paramina. Paramina is a beautiful land. Has anyone been there? Oh, what did you think? Sensational. <laughs> we recommend it, don't yeah, we? Yeah, absolutely. It's known to be a little bit like, you know, the designer, beautiful people are like, you know, just like strolling down the streets, but anybody can go and it shouldn't just be reserved for the beautiful people because that's, uh, it's, yeah, such a stunning place. Fantastic sunsets. Did you go to the lookout there and the, or the theatre? They've got an old Greek, uh, old Greek theatre there as well. It's beautiful. We saw a film festival there when we went as well. They do opera in the, in the theatre. When we tried to sneak in. <laughs> <laughs> Were they? <laughs> that would have been stunning. It was beautiful. Uh, because you can see Mount Etna in the, in the background. Can you imagine it? The sun setting and the volcano and this old Greek theatre. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so that's that. Would you like a little, before we get on to the last little bit and any questions, would we like a little um, treat? I'll pass it around. <laughs> you don't have no. <laughs> this one is a, this one is an apple. Well, it's meant to have strega liqueur, but I left it out just in case, you know, we're not, we're not wanting um, any liqueur. And liqueur is from Benevento. It's, uh, who's heard of strega? Strong stuff, isn't it? Believe me. <laughs> it's very good. Is it still open? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, people. Just up the road. Yeah, that's it. Up the road of the street. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to leave early, I understand. It's quite a lot. Uh, I'm just trying to find this um, recipe. It's made with a tray. <laughs> <laughs> so it's made with all these herbs and spices, and it's like the, a golden colour from the saffron. Mm -hmm. And um, it's strega in Italian means. Witch. Witch. So they've got a liqueur called Witch, named Witch, which I think it relates to the potion type my intensity. Mother, my mother used to put it in a case of biscuits. So in biscuits? Anything we'd say, I would just leave the alcohol. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So any kind of like uh, a lot of Italian cooking ends up tasting a bit like liqueur. It's kind of so if you want something to taste authentically Italian, add a dash of something like this, and it will you know you'll fool the, an Italian. So this is the cake. It's a torta di mele e strega. So it's like apple and strega cake. Um, and um, yeah, but I left the strega out. So it's got red apples, plain flour, bicarb soda, white sugar. This is if you're not sure if you've got allergies as well, just so you know what's in it. White sugar, soy milk, olive oil, vanilla, uh, lemon, um, and then you've got ice and sugar on top. So um, if you want to take one home, if you're not sure to try it now, but I think it's a good time when I stop talking at you and see now. I'll go around. Thank you, So this one's made with olive oil, which makes it really moist. Um, and you really don't need eggs at all. So I guess it's more like a tea cake as well.
shy, we manja, manja. <laughs> Okay. So, has anybody, as, as you're eating and, and, or whatever, I'll just ask a couple of quick questions. Um, has anybody self-published a book before? Has anybody just gone traditional publishing before? Does anybody li would like to or feel like they've got a book inside them that maybe one day they have to just see it little like this? Just so I know. Cool. I think we all have. Don't be shy. I think so too. We all have a story or, or two, don't we? Yeah. Who would write about book uh, about food? Who would write a memoir about their life story or something with that happen? Anyone else want to share what they would write about? Anyone? Great. I've got my mother's handwritten all the recipes oh. and. I, I am going to do it, get it published for the grandchildren. Oh, that's beautiful. So they can have, the, the thing is, you know, she had one recipe, say, for plum cake. Yeah. And you find the same recipe five different yeah. ways, and then you keep them all. <laughs> Admittedly, I've done that. <laughs> yeah. Use the base one and then mix it up a little bit with different things. Yeah. But um, how beautiful are handwritten recipes? I mean... That's where it all began. I mean, this is kind of a, cookbooks are a new phenomenon, really. Like, it's take, they've taken off. And, uh, you know, but back in the, you know, before printing presses, it was the handwritten notes. And I think that, that's, that's so precious. Um, so in a way, there's some really, uh, there's some really important recipes that I wanted to learn from, um, particularly my um, auntie, because my mum was passed away a couple of years ago. Speaking of which, this was a really beautiful way to, to grieve her as I was writing it, so, um, and a way to honour her as well. So um, she passed away just um, when I started writing it. So for me, it was a really, it, she's in it everywhere. So I guess it was, it's, yeah, it's, it's a special book for me because of those reasons as well. But I hope that kind of comes through in a way that connects to everybody and, and their loved ones. Um, so I'm not sure how curious you are about this journey, but um, I will give you a bit of a, a bit of a rundown, shall we? Okay, all right. Okay, so um, I decided to go self-publishing because I didn't want to wait around for a publisher to say yes, we'll publish you. Um, I've had I've got two cookbooks. My first one is called uh, Discovering Vegan Italian. It was a soft cover. It was uh, a lot. Uh, it was like 150 pages compared to 320. So. I knew I could do it, and but this one was a much, much bigger project, so um, it required a few extra steps. Um, so here's a little bit of the how I went about doing it. So first of all, you when you write a book or a cookbook, you go, well, what kind of style do I want it? So this is a travel culinary cookbook, so it's travel story and and recipes as well. And uh, so I knew that was a style I wanted to write in. And then um, to, yeah, the, the, what kind of feel I wanted to give. So for people who are writers or want to self-publish, I really encourage to get to your why to start with. Like, what, what's the story in you, like we were talking about before? Like, everybody's got a book in them, I think. So, yeah, let that be yours, your story, because it's going to have so much more heart, so much more love. Um, but that doesn't say, that's not to say don't write a billion other books, but it's like, you know, that one's probably going to be a great, a special one to do. Um, okay, and then I, I, I thought, okay, so I know I want to do Southern Italy, and so I wrote down all the list of recipes, even if I had never made them before, if I just tasted them when I went to Italy, or none of them made it once and I had no idea how to make it. So you write down all those recipes, and then sort of working out what kind of uh, structure do I want? Do I want, you know... You know, you know, some recipe books go, you know, entrees or starters and then mains or salads or sides and desserts and drinks. And I wanted to do this one via the regions that we travelled to. So that helped with the, the structure and the chapters as well. Um, and then came the biggest part, which is, of course, the, the recipes and actually getting into the kitchen and cooking them over and over and over again. And, and then maybe something wasn't quite right on the second time. And so you can't trust your own recipe, so you've got to do it again. So there's a lot of... Husband was very happy about, um, <laughs> about all the food that I was cooking. He didn't like desserts so much, so my part-time work crowd enjoyed that. The team really enjoyed the desserts I brought in and were my test bunnies. They just wanted to eat it. But I actually said, so what do you, you know, what do you think? Um, is it like the lemon too much yet? We just want to eat it, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, lots of testing 
as well, and then writing up. Yeah, so I went from handwritten notes, writing the recipes, and then typing them up, and then changing them, and you know, write, having a, a tally of which ones I've made, how many times, and you know, little notes. So you have to be quite rigorous if you want people to, to have success with the recipes. I know a lot of people um, might give it to somebody else to test as well. I mean, that's quite common. But then I thought, well, they're going to have variables in their own kitchens as well. So, you know, oven temperatures and how they cook it, maybe they don't follow the recipe properly. Um, so, yeah, I thought I'll just, I'll, I'll keep it quite standard. And so I did it all myself. Um, and then you can see the behind the scenes of the photography. So you can see my dodgy couch in the background. Um, and, you know, the old, you know, uh, tables outside, um, and so it's just, you know, what you see behind the, uh, the photos is quite a simple setup. So the light from the window is important. Um, I've got another light box on the other side when it was a sort of dull and dreary day, and um, just a very, I want to upgrade the camera, but you can really achieve a lot, you know, with some simple things. And choosing, you know, um, your props and, and those sorts of things. I'm gonna show you the, the finished result of this one. But during lockdown, so I did this, I started it in 2020 and finished it um, November last year. So it was a, like a lockdown project. Um, and during lockdown, a lot of the shots were closed so I couldn't get new props. So I just had to like go, oh, who can I borrow something from? And so that was the finished one there. So how many shots do you think you took to look at? Before yeah. you did? Yeah, sometimes I'll take 50, other times I'll take 100, wow. other times 10. It depends if I've, um, the lighting is really annoying me <laughs> and if I just can't get it right. Or well, sometimes I'll just go back and do it again, like the artichokes. Artichokes are really hard to make look pretty, so I did those about uh, five, six times. <laughs> six times, to, because each time the photo just wasn't quite right. Um, so... There's a lot of artichokes. There we go. So yeah, that was the artichoke, the stuffed artichoke anyway in the end. So that's had many different looks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, and that's a special pasta. I should have added it to the slide. The special pasta that my nonna would, uh, would roll. And then my, I got my auntie to show me how to do it a few years ago. Cicatelli, similar to cavatelli. And... Yes, and then we get into the cookbook file, which is probably the hardest bit to teach yourself how to use. Um, I used Adobe InDesign, but once you know how to use it, then you can keep making books and pamphlets and things like that. Proofreading, not so much fun. <laughs> um, I did as much as I could. I printed out, so you've got, you know, you've got this um, screen in front of you, and then you know, it's it's there's only so much you can keep looking at it. So then you print it out and uh, get lots of cups of tea. <laughs> And then I passed it on to a couple of friends who put their hand up to proofread as well, which was really well, great. It pushed it to the next level. And actually one of my friends happened to be a um, professional proofreader, so I got lucky there. Um, and then uh, yeah, the cover, the cover, you know, do you go photo, photographic, do you go illustrated? It's a bit all the rage to go illustrated these days. So I thought, oh, well, um, I just wanted something a bit classic. So I got a, I commissioned somebody to do the watercolour, I just explained what I wanted and that's how that came um, to fruition. Um, the printing was a little bit more difficult this time because it's an offset printer um, printed over in China um, and so when you want to do a big run of, of books and you want to do it pr profession, as professional as possible, um, quite often sending it overseas. Um, that, I did want to do it here uh, but ended up being way too expensive. So. Um, but a good way to start with somebody is to do digital, with your own cookbook is, or own book is to do digital printing. I did that with my first one. It still looks really great, but it's a lot cheaper and you can do it closer to home as well. So, um, and I wanted it hardcover and bound quite nicely, so I had to, had to send it overseas. And there's a lot more um, involved with your actual file and getting it right as well. So, um, including how much ink your actual photo has and all those sorts of things. So it was a lot to learn. And then, of course, promoting, getting it into bookstores, doing uh, things like this lovely library talks and a book launch I'll have next week and um, just sharing it. That's the fun part and, and being here with you tonight um, instead of behind a computer during lockdown. This is a, this is a nice moment. 
um, and mm -hmm. the distri distribution doing it all yourself as well. So there you go. And that's um, that's in the town of Molinara. My cousin also took that photo um, with the poppies in springtime, so just before summer hit. Um, so thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed being here today. Yeah, if, if, does anybody have um, any, any questions about Italy, about travel, about cuisine, about books in general, or anything they just want to share that's inspired them? Yes. Can you just explain how Beto took an ice break? I'm not oh. sure you said I was there with an ice break. Great. Yeah, it's a bit of a mystery. Yeah. So, um... I actually put together a little um, video to how to cook an artichoke for people who um, pre-ordered the cookbook. But feel free, I can, if I grab your email, I can share you a video of how to. But how to cook an